important. How important is feminism to you in your life and in your writing? Well, to me, it's a very rational response to the world. <laughs> it's the only common sense response. Um, I mean, you know, but only in the sense that it's, I don't, I'm not at all anti-male, which I think a lot of feminism is tarred with that brush. I'm certainly, I would like to address any, any inequality that I see. Um, and Claire, I think Claire, I think a very, women like Claire who, um, I mean, Claire, as you saw then, got, gets pregnant at university, so she has to give up her degree and she becomes a wife and a mother. And I think in the 70s, it was just that kind of sea change was starting, you know, the sort of radical feminism, feminist movement, um, it's just beginning to filter down to kitchens and housewives, I think, in the mid-70s. Um, and she's kind of feeling those reverberations very slightly. And I think Michael Francis, although, you know, isn't a patriarch, but he's beginning to wonder what on earth's happening. You know, he's sensing that there's a change afoot. Mm. So I didn't, yeah, I didn't want to write too overtly about the feminist movement. I mean, Claire's just, she's doing an open university degree. Um, but Michael Francis believes it's in response he, he believes it's a kind of aggressive act when actually I don't think it is. She just wants to get her degree. Um, you're a mother of one boy and two girls. Mm. And I, I wonder, as you're raising them, do you see the difference in how society treats them? Yeah, well, I do. Yeah, I do. I, I, it's very interesting, actually. I'm, I'm pleased I've got a boy and a girl. And I think there are huge pressures on both genders, actually, to behave or conform in a certain way. But, and I always try to discourage them from trying to conform to those pressures. I was having a discussion recently with my daughter. She said, she said, the only difference between boy and girls is what you have in your pants. And I said, <laughs> right on. We were in the queue in Sainsbury's, and she said, did say it quite loudly. <laughs> That's a bit, OK, let's move on. Um, <laughs> but no, it is. I mean, I do, get, I, I do get really furious, actually, still, with the way, particularly with the way girls are treated and the way they're expected to behave in a certain way. And, you know, my daughter had been at, nursery I think for a week or so and she came back and said what is a princess and I thought oh no <laughs> you know I'd kind of created this bubble for her and when I was reading her Grimm's fairy tale I'd say skip over the word princess because I think not that I've got anything against princesses per se but that whole you idea that Henry Mantel <laughs> oh god no Henry Mantel <laughs> that's a whole other subject but um yeah I was telling you I think when we met I was having a rant to you about Boots the chemist who I think you know, it's a wonderful institution, I think particularly for women, it sort of takes care of you at every different stage of your life. And I went to go and buy my new baby, who's eight months old, some reins to strap her into a high chair, and they had reins for boys, which said train driver, and reins for girl, which say little cupcake. And you just think, why? I don't want my daughter to think she's going to be a baked good, you know. I mean, <laughs> can't she, why can't she be a train driver? And also, why should boys be a train driver? They could be anything they want. I just, it made me so cross. So I did rant to this poor um, Boots manager in <laughs> the middle of the morning one day. He obviously thought, oh, God, this bad woman. But, yeah, no, I'm having a bit of a fight with them on email about it. I'm not going to give up till they take them out of circulation. <laughs> Terrible. But you started writing after you'd gone when you were working at The Independent, mm. is that right? and one of your jobs was doing the TV listings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so how did you manage, manage the two? Well, in a way, the TV listings job, which is actually literally the worst job I've ever done. I mean, and I've been a chambermaid, and, you know, I've done many things. Um, but <laughs> it was... No, so I was responsible at the time um, for um, putting... You know, they gave me the text to put in, you know, the sort of TV listing text, and I'd have to make it all fit and put it on the right font. And it was... I don't know, it was one of those jobs that's just technical enough that you can't completely switch your brain off. And so I would do this. I think it was four days a week I did it. And at the end of the day, I'd be on the tube, just on my head, to be kind of exploding with boredom and frustration. Um, and actually, I did. The terrible thing was I didn't have a TV at the time. Um, and, I, <laughs> and I had no idea what all those numbers were after the programme. And occasionally, to make it fit the line, I used to just cut a couple off. <laughs> <laughs> just puts it... Uh, well, I don't even know what they are. And then a friend of mine explained to me, those are video code numbers, and if you cut them off, whoever it is is trying to, you know, code it in, and they'll never get the programme. So if anyone was there in the 90s, I'm really sorry if you missed, <laughs> you missed your recording. I didn't do it after that. But, um, yeah, so I think... So it was so boring that I used to go home, and I was just desperate for some kind of mental stimulation. And so that's where, after you've gone came in, it would just be the thing that I would do when I got home or at weekends or in the evenings. Um, you're married to an author, William Sutcliffe, author of Are You Experienced? 
very funny book. Um, <laughs> is it true? I know that he's your first reader. Mm. Is it true that you keep a plaster cast of his teeth <laughs> in view? <laughs> he's so <laughs> cross with me for saying that in a newspaper. <laughs> I do actually, yeah, he does. <laughs> Which is very odd, but yeah, he does. You know, he's always been my first reader actually, because we were friends for a long time before we were a couple. I've known him since I was 18. Um, and yeah, so it's, his opinion is very important to me. And he's very harsh and very mean. And he does read everything, but I don't, we don't have, we have a policy now of not telling each other what we're working on. So it's always a secret um, until we actually give him, or he gives me his first draft. Because um, I think you'll, someone's first reading of something is very important and just the impact of not knowing what you're about to read, you know, is sort of make it as unartificial as possible. Um, so he, <laughs> the only time he said that really worried him was when I was writing Esme Lennox and he saw all these books that I would get from Aid Books and, you know, these kind of old books, all about mad women. And he said he did think, oh, Jesus, what's she doing? <laughs> this kind of bookshelf of really grim, depressing, institution-type books would appear on my shelf. Um, how would, oh, yeah, the teeth. Um, so, yeah, so his opinion is always very... It's quite brutal, but it's good, because obviously, you know, you don't want someone just to say, yeah, it's lovely, you know, don't change a word. I mean, it would be nice if he said that, but he never does. But you need someone who's going to be very brutal with you and say, this isn't working and that's not working, this isn't bad, but, you know. Um, so, yeah, so I do... And I <laughs> recently, he was clearing out his desk and he did find a plaster cast of his teeth, which he'd had made from the sport. I don't know, some gum shield or something. Um, and I said, oh, can I have them? Because I've always really liked... He's got very nice teeth, not like me. I've got really rubbish teeth. Um, and so I said, can I have it? And so I have it on my shelf in my study and every time I just get slightly carried away or my metaphors get a little bit too flowery I can glance across and think no he's going to hate it <laughs> <laughs> so I have to, it sort of reins me in on my slightly more fanciful tendencies I think <laughs> do you uh, do you find dealing with technology is uh, a help or a hindrance I mean I know authors nowadays are expected to do lots of work on social networks and ebooks mm. and all of that sort of stuff added content um when you're writing is that a distraction well it is i'm actually really naughty and i don't um i don't do you have any i'm not on facebook i'm not on twitter i don't do any of that just really because i don't have the time i mean you know i've got three kids and i'm i need to write my books and if i think if i did that i wouldn't do anything <laughs> i also feel there's only a certain number of words you have in your tank and I can't, I need to channel them at the moment into fiction rather than into Twitter, I suppose. But I haven't got anything against it. It's just not something I am able to do. Um, but I do have, I actually have two computers as <laughs> well. So I have one which I do all my sort of admin journalism emailing on. And I have another one um, which I only write on. I only write fiction on. And when I bought it, I, um, <laughs> and it's a very beautiful iBook. I love it. And I said to the guy, I took it to the desk and I said, I, I want to buy this. I said, but can you disable all the email, all the internet on it? And he said, why do you want me to do that? Why would you buy an iBook and disable it? And I just said, I just need to. I, I can't have it there at all. So I do think the, you know, Cyril Connolly thought that the enemy to art was the pram in the hallway. But to me, it's definitely the router in the hallway. Mm. You know, who needs it? You need to completely cut yourself off. I can't write if I know my email's going ping. <laughs> or I'm thinking, how is that eBay auction going? It's never. <laughs> nothing's going to get done. Um, I've got one final question before I hand over to our lovely audience. Um, and I know it's one that writers get sick of being asked, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, Go for it. Favourite authors and favourite books. Wh who do you think has most influenced you as a, as a writer? Well, there wouldn't be any one person, um, but certainly there are lots of books I really read. Um, and they would be Jane Eyre and... Um, Albert Camus, The Outsider, uh, Earthly Powers by Anthony Burgess. Um, see, my mind always goes totally blank now. <laughs> Bryce had revisited. Bryce, right, thank, thank you. Bryce had revisited. And um, Angela, a lot of Angela Carter. I love Angela Carter. And, you know, there are so many contemporary authors that I would always read. I would always read William Boyd and Margaret Atwood and Hilary Mantel, Ali Smith. You know, there's countless. A lot of poetry as well. I do read quite a lot of contemporary poetry. Um, so, yeah, it's impossible to kind of answer concisely, but many, many things.